14 and a few verses from chapter 15. But in order to catch the flow once more, we will read a verse or two from chapter 13 also. So if you would turn to Joshua chapter 14, and before we read there, note chapter 13, verse 14, which says, To the tribe of Levi alone Moses gave no inheritance. The offerings by fire to the Lord God of Israel are their inheritance, as he said to him. And then the last verse of chapter 13, To the tribe of Levi Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance, as he said to them. And these are the inheritances which the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan. That is stressed, of course, because chapter 13 is concerned with the inheritance at the wrong side of the Jordan, beyond the Jordan. So this is in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel distributed to them. And we need to note at this point that Caleb, who will appear in a moment, was one of the heads of the houses. Verse 2, Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded Moses, for the nine and one half tribes. For Moses had given an inheritance to the two and one half tribes beyond the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in, that is, 48 cities of refuge, only cities to dwell in with their pasture lands, for their cattle and their substance. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. They allotted the land. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses the man of God in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me. I was forty years old when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brethren who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, Behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these forty-five years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day eighty-five years old. I am still as strong to this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now, give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out as the Lord said. And we remind ourselves that the Anakim were their fiercest foes. They were the descendants of the giants of the land. Then Joshua blessed him. And he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. So Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arva. This Arva was the greatest man amongst the Anakim, and the land had rest from war 
And finally, in chapter 15, reading from verse 13. According to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he gave to Caleb the son of Jephunneh a portion amongst the people of Judah, Kiriath Arva, that is Hebron. Arva was the father of Anak. And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. And he went up from there against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name of Debir formerly was Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, Whoever smites Kiriath Sefer and takes it, to him will I give Achsa, my daughter, as wife. And Othniel. I'm sure you all know that Othniel was the first judge of Israel. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it. And he gave him Achsa, his daughter, as wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she alighted from her ass, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Give me a present, since you have set me in the land of the Negev. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper and the lower springs. Amen. And may God add the blessing of understanding and application to this, the reading of his word. All the way through to 19 is concerned with the allotment of inheritance tribe by tribe within the land of Israel. The New Testament teaches us to understand this in terms of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Not only in the book of Hebrews, of course, but by the way Paul speaks of the Exodus in 1 Corinthians. So there's a direct and a practical application to the word, of the word rather, to our lives this morning and whenever we come to such passages as are set before us. Last week we learned that there is always much land yet to be possessed that the land is always greater on the inside than it looked from the outside. There is always a higher up and a further in for us to go on with. There is always much land to be possessed. And we also learn that within the inheritance Christ has won by His death and resurrection. There is a specific, there is a special inheritance in Him for each one of His people. And much of our unhappiness in the Christian life can arise when we fail to recognize that which Christ intends for us and seek other things other than His inheritance. Now, we are not going to deal with these chapters 13 to 19, verse by verse, not even chapter by chapter. But bearing in mind their whole purpose, which is to tell us of the allocation of the different inheritances by lot, we're going to dig out what I would think are the nuggets before picking up again on the narrative in chapter 20. And so there are two things before us this morning in this chapter. Before Joshua turns to deal with the allotment of the nine and a half tribes having already dealt with the two and a half tribes outside the land. Before he does this, he must deal with those who had no inheritance in the land, that is the Levites. And he is also compelled to deal with the individual of Judah, the man Caleb. Now, I want to, with your patience and understanding, deal very, very quickly with the Levites, almost to take them out of the way that we should move on to consider Caleb this morning. I have good reason for doing that, Uh, and one of the reasons within it would be that we've already dealt with the Levites when we studied this subject in the book of Numbers. But let, let me remind you that these people had no physical, no geographical possession within the land of Israel except the 48 cities of refuge, sanctuary cities. The reason for this is given away back in Genesis 
when Simeon and Levi together, these two fool brothers, in anger and in pride disobeyed their father and disobeyed God by taking vengeance on the dishonoring of their sister Dinah. The book of Genesis ends with them being cursed by Jacob. Now that curse was something which was lifted when they alone of all the tribes turned to be on the Lord's side with Moses. At that point, you remember in their history, that awful point where they turned and built the golden calf and moved away from obedience to God. Of all the tribes, when Moses said, Who is on the Lord's side? Only Levi turned and supported Moses. Therefore, while Simeon, you will find in the next few chapters, is being given his inheritance, that tribe of Simeon disappeared from the nation. But the Levites never did. Through their repentance, their change of mind, when they turned to God at Kadesh Barnea, Levi was reinstated in God's purpose. Now, they never had an inheritance because of the curse. And yet they were given a unique inheritance. And by that, I don't simply mean that they could live from the offerings of the people of God in the temple. But that the Lord God Himself, the Bible insists and repeats that the Lord was their inheritance. And God's resources and power and blessing and grace came to them and came to the people, the other tribes, through them. They were called to a life of work and service. They were called to be separated to God to serve Him. And we notice from that that there is no way to serve the living God if we refuse to be separated to Him. But they were called into this special relationship where God was the first in their lives, their priority. The whole reason for their existence, their inheritance, their destiny was tied into serving the living God. They were called to stand before the Lord in worship. They were called to care for the Ark of the Covenant, the very token of His presence amongst the people. And they were to live as witnesses to God. They were the salt and light of the Old Testament. And their 48 cities, their cities of refuge and sanctuary, speak eloquently of the gospel of grace and the cross of our Lord to which we run for safety and forgiveness. This group of people who were disinherited were given a special inheritance where their purpose was to bring the grace of God to the people and the people to the grace of God. And they did this, often with great faithfulness, so that you find in the New Testament that it was a Levite who took God in the flesh in his old arm and blessed him. It's a wonderful story. People who had no inheritance, and the Lord became their inheritance. Does it speak to you? Oh, it speaks to me, but I still want to set it all aside, just for this morning, because the story of the man who comes next, who steps forward into the center of the stage, is every bit as wonderful. Now, I see this dramatically. Perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. But I see it in my mind's eye. Can you, can you envisage it? With all the peoples and their representatives gathered together before Joshua to receive their inheritance. And it's a very dramatic scene. And they're about to be told who will go where and what the limits of their territory shall be. And forward steps this old man and interrupts the whole proceeding. He stops the process of allotment. It cannot go ahead until his claim is dealt with and his claim is settled upon the promise of God given no less than 45 years before. Now I would remind you that the book of Numbers tells us that Caleb was one of the leaders of the tribes who were engaged in the whole business of sorting out the allotment of territory. And I'm reminding you that you should know that if he had wished, 
he could have manipulated this. He could have, he could have used pressure and guile to get himself his promise much earlier than this, but he did nothing about it. He was engaged in the negotiations under the will of God to decide who should go where, but never apparently mentioned his own claim until 45 years later, till he recognizes the moment when God is speaking again and he steps to the front. 45 years since Kadesh Barnea. Do you remember? when the people were standing on the threshold of the land of promise on the doorstep of Canaan, they were ready to come in after a short journey from Egypt, and they wavered, and they doubted, and so they asked for spies. And God, in His mercy, gave them a second best and said, all right, have spies. But they had no faith. And when the spies came back after six weeks going through the land, Ten of them spoke honestly about the goodness of the land, but without faith concerning the giants. They said, yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants in this land. And their conclusion was this, we are not able to go up against this people because they are stronger than we are. That's what the ten said. But there were two others. The two others now in the center of this stage, there was Joshua and Caleb. And they saw the same thing and said, yes, there are giants. But we are able to overcome them because the Lord is with us. Joshua and Caleb never denied that there were giants. In fact, the story, the, the account of the Old Testament tells us that Caleb was the very one who saw the giants closest to hand because his territory turns out to be Hebron, where the giants lived. Yes, there are giants, they said, but if the Lord delight in us, he will bring us into this land. We are well able to overcome this land. Now, the ten and the two, do you remember, saw the same things. Nobody was lying. But the ten were speaking out of fear, and only the two out of faith. And the reason was this, that the ten saw and then measured these giants against themselves. But the two saw and measured these giants against God. Now, it seems to me that this is a principle that we find in operation in many places throughout history and to the present day, that very often the majority see big giants because they have a little God, and the minority see little giants because they have a great God. And it's my personal experience in recent years that minorities with a great God are often in the right. Think of the whole army of Israel faced with the Philistines, with their five cities, remember, which were also associated with giants, one of them being Gath. And there stood Goliath, and out comes young David, and all the people saw a great giant, but little David saw a great God and said, let me go. God will slay this uncircumcised Philistine. You see, it's the same principle in operation and it still operates. If your God is small, the giants are big. But if your God is great, you see the giants in a proper measure and scale. But you know what happened? The people believed the ten. They chose to believe the ten because they were faithless. And they tried to wander back into the desert. They tried, in fact, to go back to Egypt. And only Joshua and Caleb spoke up and spoke out for going on. And so that whole generation, the whole generation died in the wilderness except two men. Joshua being the one 
and Caleb being the other. And they entered the land and received the promise because they were faithful to God and believed what he said. They were, in fact, the only two of their generation who could have claimed to be like their father Abraham. Do you know what Romans says of Abraham? No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced, says Paul, that God was able to do what he had promised. Now that's a description also of Caleb. Fully convinced that God was able to do as he promised. Now, I ask you just to consider the fact that this man for 45 years held on to that promise. Now, if you read your Bible carefully, you will find that it speaks honestly about the rebellions of the people of God. But nowhere will you find one reference to Caleb in those rebellions. You'll find their bitterness expressed in grumbling against Moses and against the leadership and against God himself. But nowhere, not once, will you find Caleb numbered amongst them. You'll find an honest account of their disobedience and their rejection of God. But nowhere is Caleb numbered with them. When they took to idols, Caleb had nothing to do with it. He was never numbered with the people, but he lived amongst them. And there's a token there and a sign there for the way we should live if we know ourselves to be living in a crooked generation. And if we live in a faithless church. First of all, do not align yourself with the grumblers and the disobedient and the rebellious and those who take to idols. Don't be numbered with them. No compromise with that. But the second thing is that you don't run away and form another nation of Israel. You stay in if it means 45 years of dogged faithfulness. And I say that in the face of friends today who want to withdraw and have another secession or disruption. Nonsense. That case is not proved. Forty-five years he lived amongst the faithless people and he held on to the promise of God and he was almost alone. He only had Joshua until the new generation rose up. And now, now after these 45 years, he steps forward and he claims the promise of God and he quotes God's word to God's servant. Now imagine those 45 years of struggling. What kind of temptation to compromise? What kind of temptation in his weariness traveling with this disobedient folk to break away from them or to just become part of them? Think of this man who knew the greatness of God and knew that the people should have walked in and taken the land, who now had to fight at Jericho. He was part of that. And then watch the humiliation of defeat at Ai. He was part of that. See the people learn the lessons he had learned 45 years ago when victory was given at Ai. He was part of that. And through it all, he holds on to the promise of God, watching the generation die and disappear, watching the next generation rise, watching them tempted to make the same mistakes, and he stays quiet. And the promise of God never leaves him. His faith in God, his trust in the promise, shines like the sun in the darkness of this people's history. What a minority! Two men! And then comes the time. And he steps out from the crowd and he says, Now give me the hill country of which the Lord spoke in Kadesh Barnea. Give me my inheritance. What unshakable faith. What immovable conviction. What complete trust in God. I wholly followed the Lord, he says. Now, we are not speaking, the Bible is not speaking about unthinking, implacable, 
unlistening faith in a human sense, but it's showing us faith in God when it cannot be shaken. Real conviction in the gospel and trust in God. And we must long for this in ourselves and ask God to create it and sustain it in us. We have a great inheritance, won for us by God in His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, is our faith in Him, the faith of Caleb, a faith in God and His promises which is unshakable? Not humanly implacable, but built upon God's grace and unshakable. Not because we are unshakable, but because the rock on which we stand shall not be moved. Now, we waver. And sometimes we do have our doubts and our fears and our anxieties. But the Bible says these are unnecessary if our foundation is in Christ and in what He has done on the cross and in His resurrection. Why would we waver? Oh God, make us like Caleb and raise up more Caleb's amongst us. I want to note just three things very briefly before we part from one another this morning. The first is this claim, which might sound to you like a boast if you weren't reading it in context. That is, he says, his strength never weakened. Eighty-five years old, and he's still the same fighting man he was at forty. I know somebody not more than a hundred miles from here who's eighty-five years old. And although he may not be physically as strong as he was, he's still the fighting man in the spiritual warfare he was at 40. And there are those of you here who know fine who I mean. He's a Caleb to me and to many in Scotland. You know, the fact is, though, that it's not Caleb's strength that's in view here. It's not Caleb's strength that's in focus, but God's. And he gives the glory to God himself, Caleb, when he says, it may be, verse 12, he says, it may be that the Lord will be with me. And if he is, I'll drive out these descendants of Anak. We spoke to the children about being permanent residents, not visitors. Oh God, make us like that. Oh God, make us like that. Whatever age we live to on this earth, strong in Him, faithful to Him. The second thing I'd like you to note is that He shared His inheritance with His nephew who became His son-in-law. That's why we read the verses from chapter 15. And I just want to point out to you, although there's no time to consider it today, just to point out to you that blessing from God is for sharing that if we know the grace of God in His saving power and mercy, we are meant to allow it to fill us till we start to overflow to others some way. And I don't think it's any accident at all that his son-in-law became the first judge of Israel. Read Judges chapter 3, and you'll find that the first man who judged Israel was Othniel, his son-in-law. But finally, what I want you to think about is the place he chose. Let me deal with this under two quick headings. Hebron. It was the land of the giants. It's good, isn't it? It's good, isn't it? This 85-year-old saint and soldier, and the place he chose to walk through the land was the place where the giants lived, and that's the place he wanted. He wanted the hardest land to take. He wanted high ground. Wherever the foot, wherever the sole of his foot had trod, that was his inheritance, and he'd trodden over Hebron in the hill country. And you know, the Bible tells us, we read it in chapter 15 at verse 14, the Bible tells us that of all the tribes and peoples of Israel, only one man was fully successful in driving the enemy out. And who was it? It was Caleb. You see, the man who wholly followed God, wholly inherited in victory. The only man who took his whole inheritance was Caleb. 
and he took it because he was the only man who wholly followed God apart from Joshua, who died before all this came to be. What a lesson. What a lesson. To go for the high ground. To seek with all our hearts and wills to wholly follow Christ and to ask Him to drive out enemies before us. They may be enemies of sin in our own character, in our lives. They may be other obstacles and problems in our ongoing faithfulness to Jesus, but we can ask Him to drive out the giants before us. We've got this promise that He who wholly follows God will have a whole inheritance. There is no triumphalism in the Bible that I can see, but there is triumph. And the Bible teaches that triumph is the product of obedience. He chose Hebron. What a man. He chose Hebron because it was a hard place, because he wanted to take on giants, because he still had a vision of a great God. He'd never lost it. As some here have. And the second thing about Hebron, the last thing this morning, is that this was not only a place of power, it's not only the stronghold of the enemy, but this was a very precious place, Hebron. Do you know about it? This is where God promised the land to Abraham in the first place in Genesis chapter 13. This is where the whole land was promised to the people of God. It is that precious. And this is where Abraham bought his grave for Sarah, his wife. It's where Abraham and Jacob were buried. You go there and you'll find an Islamic shrine to it to this day in the town of Hebron. And the word Hebron means fellowship. That's what Caleb wanted. Not just a place where giants were, but he wanted the high ground of fellowship with God. He wanted to take the place of promise. He wanted to take precious ground. He wanted to take the most heavily defended part of the land of Canaan where the giants dwelt. He wanted to take the place where he would meet the stiffest opposition because the enemy above all, did not want Hebron to fall. I tell you this, there is a place where the enemy of our souls still does not want to give an inch. And it's the place of fellowship with God in Christ. It's the place of true union with Christ. It's the place of closeness to Jesus. And that is ground which is high and heavily defended. But we learn from Caleb that it will fall to those who have a vision of a great God and who wholly follow the Lord. My dear friends, I am inviting you through the Word this morning to take high ground. If there are giants, don't be surprised. If there is resistance and conflict, why should you expect anything else? Our Lord said you will, you will suffer in the world. But the Word is inviting us to take high ground and precious ground. The ground of closeness to Jesus Christ, it will fall to you if you wholly follow Him. Amen.